Hello to whoever's watching this video. Thank you for joining me. My name is Dr. Noga Schiller and I am the veterinary medical advisor at BioGal Labs. And I've also worked as a veterinarian in small animal practices for many years. And this video is the fourth video of a series of videos all about the world of canine vaccination. And today I do want to talk with you guys about a, a little bit more complex topic, which is vaccinating the high risk dog. Now, what do I mean when I say the high risk dog? These are dogs that are in an increased risk when we vaccinate them. And I will get into exactly what that means. But before I do that, I want to kind of remind whoever did not watch the first video about general vaccinations, I do recommend watching the first video because I do go more in depth about what vaccines are, what vaccines we give our dogs and how they work. But for whoever hasn't watched that video, I will, I want to do a short summary about how do vaccines even work? What are they? So vaccines is basically injecting into the dog a weakened or killed microorganism, which in most cases we're talking about a virus. The body will develop what is called a primary immune response, which is the first time that the immune system sees this particular virus, and more specifically, the particular antigen of the virus. So the immune system responds and fights this disease, and one part of the immune system is the development of antibodies. And these antibodies are specific to the antigen of the virus. The virus is eliminated, the dog does not get sick because again, we have a weakened or killed virus, but the body does remember the specific virus because these antibodies will stay in the body for months, for years, and in some cases, even for lifetime of the dog. And then if the dog gets infected by the real virus, the live virus, the body can respond much faster and it's what's called our secondary immune response. So the body responds much faster and eliminates this live virus. A uh, quick summary also what vaccines we do give to our dogs. So they're divided into two groups. We have our core vaccines and our non-core vaccines. And our core vaccines are those that are recommended for all dogs, regardless of where they live, regardless of their lifestyle. These are really highly infectious viruses that cause grave and also fatal diseases. So it is really important that our dogs are protected from these diseases. And we have four viruses. We have our canine parvovirus, our canine distemper virus, our canine adenovirus, and our rabies virus. It's important for me to just remind some of you viewers out there that because rabies is a, a virus that can infect humans, in many countries there are laws about when we vaccinate, how often we vaccinate. So when I'm kind of talking about our vaccination protocols, we do need to take into consideration that there are also laws when it comes to rabies virus. And then we have our non-core vaccines. These are vaccines that might not be necessary for all dogs. It depends on where they live. It depends on their lifestyle. And in general, we evaluate the risk. We have our Leptospira. Leptospira is a bacteria that in many countries it is considered a core vaccine because it is endemic and it is zoonotic, which means that you can pass to humans. So you might be living in a country where your veterinary does consider it a core vaccine that's done annually, and that is perfectly fine. And then we have others like Lyme disease, Bordetella, Influenza, and others. So let's get back to our high risk dog. What dog is considered higher risk for vaccination? We have four main groups. We have dogs that have an autoimmune disease, dogs that have immunodeficiency diseases, dogs that are currently taking immunosuppressive treatments, and dogs that have had adverse reactions to a prior vaccination. So let's get into each of these groups. The autoimmune diseases. What is an autoimmune disease? It's when the immune system thinks that a part of its own body, it's usually either the ce certain cells or certain proteins are foreign to the body and they're invading the body and the immune system will attack them. This is not common in dogs, it's pretty rare. We don't know what causes these diseases and the most frequent ones are, there are three most frequent autoimmune diseases. The first one is called IMHA, which is Immune Modulated Hemolytic Anemia. 
And it's basically when the body will attack the red blood cells. And these red blood cells are responsible for carrying oxygen to different parts of the body. So when they're under attack, we have less oxygen in different parts of the body. And what we'll see is a dog that's weak, that has pale gums, that can have difficulty breathing, and in more severe cases, can also collapse. We have ITP. ITP is when the body attacks the platelets. The platelets are the cells that are responsible for blood clotting. So they're, they stop the, um, the blood from continuously leaking. And uh, when they're attacked and we don't have these platelets, we'll see a dog that has more bruises and also uncontrolled, uncontrolled bleeding. So we could get a scratch or something and then we'll continuously bleeding, continuously bleed. These bleedings can also be inside the body. And the last one we have is called PF or Pemphigus foliaceus. And this is a disease that attacks the skin cells. So we'll have all sorts of kind of skin symptoms of cracks and fissures and pustulize, scaling, and also skin infect infections, secondary skin infections. Our immune deficiency diseases are different. The immune deficiency diseases are when the immune system is weak or is not functioning properly. And when our immune system is weak, the dog is more susceptible, is at a higher risk of infections of any other kind of infection. There, are, These immune deficiency diseases are divided into two main groups. We have a primary and secondary. The primary group is rare. And it's an inherited condition. And it basically, it's part of the immune system just to fa fails to develop. So these dogs are born with this immune deficiency. Our secondary immune deficiency diseases are more common and they're, they have many different causes and the most frequent causes are there are different types of viruses that will attack the immune system. These are, for example, our core viruses that we talked about, our distemper virus and our parvovirus. Cancer, there are certain types of cancer that attack the immune system and also chemotherapy for cancer also attacks the immune system and certain medications which is our third group. So the third group is these immunosuppressive medications. These are medications that weaken the immune system. So similar to our diseases before that will weaken the immune system, in this case, it's medications that the dogs are taking. And usually these medications are used to treat autoimmune diseases because we have our body over attacking or attacking something that it's not supposed to attack and we will use these medications to uh, suppress this uh, overstimulation of the immune system. So it's used for IMHA that we talked about before, for ITP, also for atopic dermatitis, uh, which is an autoimmune skin disease. And the most typically used are steroids. Uh, now in steroids, it really also depends on the dose. So if your dog is taking steroids short term and low do dose, then it's not necessarily an immunosuppressive because it is used also as anti inflammatory. So it really depends on the dose. But when we're using it to treat these autoimmune diseases, then we are usually using it at immunosuppressive doses. Other medications now that are commonly used we have cyclosporin, which uh, for whoever's in America, and um, maybe you've heard it more called Atopica, and Apoquel. Uh, they are less immunosuppressive, especially Apoquel, and are also very useful to fight certain autoimmune disease like atopic dermatitis. And we have chemotherapy, which is used to treat cancer in some cases, in tumors in some cases, and it is also immunosuppressive. So when it comes to vaccinating the immunocompromised dog, I know this is kind of... Uh, this is this is not an easy topic, so I hope that uh, up until now everything was clear. Uh, so there aren't enough in-depth studies that we have that understand the link between vaccination and these autoimmune diseases and these immunosuppressive diseases. And what I mean by link is two ways. It's also can vaccination cause these diseases? We're not sure. And can vaccination, a dog that already has one of these diseases, can vaccination reactivate the disease? 
if the dog has been treated and is now much better, or how will the vaccination influence the dog that already has one of these diseases? So we don't really have a lot of answers for, for either of these questions. However, we do knew, know that vaccination stimulates the immune system. And vaccination uh, is, is, is deeply connected to our immune system. So we do need to be more careful with these patients. And what can we do? How can we be more careful with these patients? So we can try to avoid certain type of vaccines that stimulate the immune system a bit more. And these are live or modified live vaccines. So I talked about in the beginning that we have weakened viruses and we have killed viruses. So the killed viruses are a bit safer in, in these types of dogs. And generally, if we can use killed viruses instead of our modified live vaccines, it is recommended. And recommended to give only core vaccines, because these, these vaccines, again, are really important. But that does depend on the area and the lifestyle. Because like I said, Leptospira is also, it's, in some countries, it's not technically a core vaccine, but it can still be very important in certain dogs in certain areas. Spacing out vaccines. In many cases, we give a few vaccines together, even in one shot. So in these dogs, it's probably better to spread them out, give each vaccine separately and spread them out each time for a few, a few weeks apart at least. When we're talking about treatment with immunosuppressive medication, then if it's possible, it's always better to wait till we finish the treatment. If it's a lifelong treatment, then that isn't really possible. But in many cases, it is a more short-term treatment. So if we wait these few weeks or a few months, and just after we're done with the treatment to give vaccines, that is a much better idea. And the last thing is to check if the vaccine is even needed. Because we do have our vaccination protocol, which recommends giving our core vaccines every three years. And for parvovirus, for adenovirus, and for distemper virus, and that's not necessarily needed. There are many dogs that don't necessarily need their booster shot every three years. I, again, I do talk about it a lot more in detail in my first video about general vaccination. So especially in these high-risk dogs, we should check if they even need their booster shot, if a booster shot is necessary by using VaxiCheck, and I will talk about what VaxiCheck is at the end. And let's talk about our fourth group. Our fourth group are these dogs that have had adverse reactions to vaccination. So you took your dog to the vet already, the dog had gotten some sort of vaccination and didn't react so good to this vaccination. Generally, there are two groups. There are reactions that are normal. Why are they normal? Because again, we are stimulating the immune system. So if there's some sort of reaction uh, to the stimulation, it can be perfectly normal. And what is normal? If, we if the dog has pain at the vaccination site, so if your dog is suddenly scratching the area a lot or seems a little bit uncomfortable in that area, it is normal. Mild fever, a bit of lethargy, a, reluct a reluctance to play or exercise, reduced appetite, and if we're giving nasal vaccination, it could cause sneezing. So basically, our dog is kind of a little bit tired, is a little bit bleh, doesn't really want to play a lot. And this happens usually the same day of the vaccination or maximum the day after. And this is pretty normal. And usually we don't need to treat these dogs and it passes by itself. What is not normal? So it is not normal if the dog pretty close to the vaccination. So we're talking about hours or a day after starts vomiting or has diarrhea facial swelling, hives, the dog collapses or has difficulty breathing. These are all things that could be part of what is called an anaphylactic reaction, which is grave, which is serious, and you do need to notify the veterinarian immediately if this happens. So these are not normal reactions. This means that the dog has had an adverse reaction to vaccinations. I will say, for example, vomiting or diarrhea is something pretty general. So it is really important to tell your veterinarian if it happens close to vaccination, but it might not necessarily mean that this is a reaction to the vaccination. So what, what do we do in cases where we have these dogs that have reacted badly to vaccination? What can we do with them? 
So the most important thing, in my opinion, is to make sure that the veterinarian that is giving the vaccination knows that your dog has a history of adverse reactions. Even if it's the same veterinarian that gave the vaccination that caused this adverse reaction, it's still really important to make sure that they know that they remember that it's written down. Also here, it is recommended to separate vaccines by a few weeks, do them a few weeks apart. Also, again, to kind of stimulate the immune system less, but in this case, because your, your dog has probably reacted to one certain type of vaccine, and that does not necessarily mean that he's allergic to other types of vaccines, and it helps us better understand what vaccine causes this adverse reaction. In many cases, the veterinarian will want to give a pre-medication with antihistamines or steroids or both to reduce the risk of adverse reaction when giving the, the vaccination. So usually they'll give first some pre-medication, you do have to wait a little bit of time and then give them vaccination. It's really important, especially in these dogs, that they're closely observed for the first few hours, the first few days after vaccination. So that could either be, depending on how bad the adverse reaction was, but that could be in a veterinary hospital that the dog will physically stay there for a few hours or just stay with with you with the pet owner uh, for these first for these first few hours where it's really important that you know that if there is some sort of reaction you can immediately go to the veterinarian now in cases of anaphylactic shock which is extremely rare uh, but these are life-threatening cases and if your dog has had a anaphylactic shock and was really at a very high risk that in these cases we do try to avoid vaccinations completely uh, but again that is extremely rare and the last thing is the same as i talked about before is to check if your dog even needs his booster shot again especially in these dogs which are at higher risk which do, did have adverse reactions even mild adverse reactions it is much better to check if our dog even needs a booster shot that year because the vaccinations are extremely important and it is really important that our dogs are protected however in many cases a, your dog is still protected even after one year two year three years and so giving unnecessary vaccinations especially in this dog in these kind of dogs it's really better to avoid So again, can we check if our high risk dog needs his booster vaccine? We can with VaxiCheck. So what is VaxiCheck? A VaxiCheck is a simple blood test that will check the antibody levels in the blood. And I'm gonna remind you again that these antibodies are what protects the dog from infection. It, it checks the antibodies for our three core viruses, parvovirus, distemper virus, and adenovirus. And if the level of antibodies are sufficiently high, that means that our dog is currently protected and does not need to be revaccinated. If the levels are low or there aren't any antibodies, then we do need to revaccinate. Again, with these high-risk dogs, we do have to take precautions and, and try to do it in a smarter way. Uh, but however, if there aren't any antibodies, that doesn't mean that the dog is not currently protected. So this is a really easy tool to combine with the dog's yearly checkup and really make sure, especially in these high risk dogs, that we're not vaccinating them when we don't need to vaccinate them. So instead of just automatically vaccinating according to the vaccination protocol in these dogs, it is just really important to check first if they need to be vaccinated. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you wanna learn more about VaxiCheck, then click on the link and I will see you next week for my next video. Have a great day.